Welcome to the second channel, a place where we talk about, well, the first channel, or at least that's what this video is mostly going to be. Sadly, I've not had enough time to go visit anywhere particularly interesting of late. Now, this is the first chance I've had to do a video since the video about the whole Kubernetes based BBS has gone live. And that was one of those videos I thought I was more or less just making for me uh, and a handful of people who would be interested. So that's, that's, that's been more popular than I expected. Um, and in that video, I said, you know, if some people watched, I do some follow up videos in the second channel. So this is going to be one of those follow up videos, or at least part of it's going to be not 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 the whole video. Now, this is not going to be the video where I announce it's live and you can go and use it because it's not live and it's not ready for you to use it yet. My aim is to try and get the thing as close to production ready as possible before I start letting people on it. Hence the testing phase. And to be honest, I'll probably grow the circle of people who are testing it first before I make the thing live as you know we've already waited like 30 odd years for this thing so you know a, a few more months won't matter too much so what have i been doing to it well let's start with backups because in the video i mentioned i was using valero for backup but i did somewhat skirt over the details because the original version was way over an hour in length anyway and even after editing we just squeaked under the one hour mark so i didn't want to dig into all the details of that and also i'd not set everything up with Valero as, you know, I would like. So Valero is probably the most commonly used backup tool with Kubernetes distributions. And it's got two ways of backing up, using snapshots and using Restic. Now, all I set up is the snapshot part of this. So when a backup job runs, it creates a snapshot object in Kubernetes. And there's the general snapshot controller. That's not part of Valero. It's just there to handle snapshots in general. That picks up those objects and then uses the CSI. You can think of that as like a driver that talks to whatever your filing system is and uses that to trigger your underlying storage to do a snapshot of whichever volume it's telling it to do the snapshot of. Now in Sneef, as it is with LVM and a few other backends, taking a snapshot is a super lightweight operation. Essentially, all it does is write a bit of metadata that says there is a checkpoint here. If we modify storage blocks after this point, then we don't store them in the original location because that's now part of the snapshot. We write those altered blocks into a different storage location. So that way, when you back up with snapshots, it's basically almost instantaneous, at least for the local storage volumes. Valero still has to write all the metadata about your cluster to somewhere, and typically that's an S3-like blob of storage somewhere that's not part of the cluster. And that's all I got set up in the original video. And as backup solutions go, it's pretty good. Backup is instantaneous, restore is pretty much instantaneous too. And as long as you have more than one node in your Ceef cluster, which, which I don't, if a machine dies, there's no issue because all your snapshots are stored somewhere else on another node, and you just replace that node and Ceef just rebuilds everything. However, what you're not covered for is what happens if you lose the whole cluster, which given in my case, it's a cluster of one node, you know, a lot more likely than it is for other clusters, let's put it that way. Well. That's where the whole Restic backup thing comes in. Now, you may remember that everything deployed in this cluster is deployed with Helm charts and using Argo CD to roll it out for us. So we're going to edit the file that Argo CD uses to create its app object that defines what Helm chart it's going to deploy into the cluster and the values it's going to pass to that Helm chart. Now, if you can see the original ones where we set up the snapshots, now I'm going to modify this because we can snapshot a lot more frequently than we would do remote backup. So this was all originally done with a morning, an afternoon, an evening, and a nighttime backup, four in a day. But we can easily do once an hour, because there's almost no load on the system to do that, as long as we don't keep too many hours. But I also add jobs so we can have a weekly and a monthly snapshot for a little while as well. So we've changed the schedule, so this is just a little bit more appropriate for snapshot-style backup, and Argo will just deploy this to the cluster and update it the moment we commit this to Git. But I'm also going to create a whole new app instance for Argo to deploy, which is going to use the same Helm chart again. And we're going to deploy Valero into a different namespace. But this time, we're not going to do snapshots. We're going to use Restic. Now, the Restic install is going to deal with our what happens if the cluster dies. Because what Restic is, is a file-based backup utility. And it essentially, each time it runs, it ships the differences in your filing system between what it was last time it did the backup and where it is now. And it uploads all of that to some S3-like storage. It can use other storage target types as well. But as we've got S3 set up to back up all our metadata, we're also going to use it for backing up all our file data too. 
Now, scheduling wise, we're going to go back to the whole morning, afternoon, evening, nighttime backups for a day because these are somewhat more intense on the cluster than just doing a snapshot because it actually has to go through all the files and check them all to see whether they've been modified and then upload them. So, IO wise, this is a lot more intensive. It's still not terrible for the platform though because the S3 storage is actually in the same building and on the same network as it. And there is a limit to how much storage a DOS BBS is actually going to use. But we are going to exclude some things from the backup. In the snapshot version, we just let it back up everything because there's relatively little harm in doing it. It's basically instantaneous. And there's nothing in this cluster we don't want to be able to restore back to this cluster. But the restic backup is not about restoring this cluster. The restic backup is what happens if we've lost the entire cluster and we're building a new one to restore into or moving our stuff into a different cluster. So we are never going to want to restore the cube system namespace, for example, as that's the internal plumbing in the cluster itself. So restoring that from one cluster into a different cluster would be catastrophic for the cluster you restore it into. There's also data it just doesn't make sense to put back into another cluster like our Prometheus data. We don't need all the alert and monitoring data for a different cluster putting back into this cluster because I don't need all the data from a dead cluster about its CPU and memory load information, for example. In the event of a complete cluster failure in my house, I am not going to have an incident meeting between myself and myself to go over this stuff. I'm just going to build a new one and move on. So I don't need the data to be able to review it. Other things like I'm not going to back up the Argo namespace because, again, if I'm restoring into a brand new cluster, I'll just install Argo into that cluster and just point it at Git and everything will just go back. As everything was deployed from Git using Argo, there's very little I have to restore from a backup in terms of the configuration and state of the cluster. All I really want at this point is the data that belongs to those applications, which, as I'm excluding namespaces from the backup and not having to include them, any new things that I deploy into here, their data is just going to get backed up by Restic by default. Now, once I've got all this set up, it takes about 10 minutes for a Restic backup to run and complete. And a big part of that is because the asterisk container is just a, a much bigger container than it should be. I'll uh, address what we're going to do with the whole asterisk thing in a, in, in a different video. But I have started trying to tackle the size of that asterisk container because it is far too unwieldy for what I want from it. Now, the little changes I've been making to this, I have been setting up the web-based client and giving that a place to live out on the public internet, at least for serving the web page and the JavaScript side of things. I have still yet to set up the rev proxy that connects that back to the WebSocket server running on my home cluster. So you might be wondering how I've been doing some testing. Well, I've been letting some of the people who have been helping me out with testing just telnet into the thing, basically, as they're all the sort of people who know how to set up a terminal in such a way that it will actually do the DOS emulation properly. Although I could really do with widening that circle once I've got the whole web thing set up and get some people involved in doing a bit of modem and dial-up testing with me, as I would like to be able to offer dial-up to the PSTN, why there still is a PSTN to, for people to use. And given the very low board rate I've gone with with those emulated modems, should be a little more tolerant to the sort of variable latency that happens with the audio channel when you're using a public SIP provider. Now, this month, I'm going to get to go to Retrofest happening at the Centre for Computer History in Cambridge, because this May, it's all about portable devices. So I'm going to fill up my car with portable stuff, which will be nice and easy to carry, hopefully, and get myself down to Cambridge. And whilst I'm there, I'm going to hopefully persuade one or two of my fellow exhibitors to maybe join the testing pool for the BBS. You never know, some of them might be interested, particularly those who kind of like modems. And that neatly brings me on to the stuff I've been doing for the rest of this month that isn't just making the video you're going to hopefully see tomorrow. Yes, I've been prepping a whole bunch of my portable machines to try and get them ready for Retrofest. Some have needed the odd capacitor replacing, some just needed a good clean. And one has been an absolute recalcitrant pain in the... Yes, there's a laptop I acquired that I was hoping to take down there because it is particularly unique, but it has been finding every possible way to refuse to install an operating system. Yep, the only thing that was missing from this thing is a hard disk, and I have had an absolute nightmare replacing it. I'll try and explain a little bit of why without giving the game away as to what it is, but essentially the whole platform normally is just SCSI based, but this laptop isn't. It's IDE based. Now you'd think that would make sorting out a hard drive easier, but no, because the OS you can install on it doesn't actually support IDE. So the laptop essentially 
emulate SCSI back out to the operating system whilst using an IDE hard drive. And that seems to have been causing more than a few problems. Now, first of all, I tried to use one of these IDE to SD adapter things. I've used a few of them in the past and they've all more or less been fine. There were one or two that gave me a, well, didn't want to work properly with an Amiga here or there. And eventually after spending a big chunk of my life trying to get the, the disk label written to this thing properly so the OS could actually understand that the hard drive was there and partition it, I eventually figured it was something this SD to IDE adapter was doing was just stopping this working. So I shifted to using a compact flash adapter instead, and that actually then started to behave. I could actually write a disk label to the thing that the machine could actually read back. I then got to the point of, right, I can install an operating system on this thing now. No. The operating system's network installer didn't want to work. It just sort of hangs and sits there playing detect the hard drive. But given that the network interfacing this thing is kind of, to get it working, there's a whole bunch of optional extras you had to buy to go with the laptop. I'm figuring the network installer option was not really well tested at all. So I thought, well, I'll install it off CD. Yeah, that's when things also took a turn for the worse. You see, it does have an external SCSI port that lets you attach a SCSI CD-ROM drive. But it doesn't let you attach any SCSI CD-ROM drive. Oh no, because the default sector size for like normal CD-ROM drives that you might use in a, in a PC, for example. Yeah, very different from the sector size that this thing assumes it's getting. For this platform, it assumes that the sector size is 512 bytes, you know, the same sector size that hard disks use. In fact, CDs for this machine are basically hard drive images on a CD. They're not ISO format at all. So I eventually found myself an external SCSI CD-ROM that supported 512 byte sectors with a little jumper you could set on the back. Plugged it up and watched it still not work. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't work. I assumed the CD-ROM drive itself doesn't work particularly reliably. And each time I try it after a lot of disk thrashing, it eventually just throws up an error saying it got a short read and aborts. So as I'm recording this, I'm going to try using a SCSI to SD emulator and put a CD image on that, set the sector size for 512. I'm just waiting for a cable I need to arrive so I can get the whole thing connected up and powered and linked up to the laptop. So if you come down to Cambridge and see me looking stressed over a laptop still trying to get it to work, You'll know that approach didn't work either. If you see me like that, accidentally, feel free to offer me a sympathy tea at this point, because I will be extraordinarily stressed. I mean, not writing code in the hotel bedroom trying to get a terminal emulator working stressed like I was last time, but you know, still probably quite stressed. Now, if any of you have ever wondered how on earth does it take me like nearly a month to make a video, this is the sort of reason why. This is what's happening in the background when I just want to show a machine working in a video for say 30 seconds with a little bit of screen capture to get to the point where I generate the, you know, 15 minutes of screen capture that I'll edit down into like a minute or so. There could have been days and days of me trying to get that machine functioning with an OS installed on it and whatever bit of software it is that I want to show you. I mean, the video that's uploading while I record this, I spent forever getting the machine working and installing software on it so I could show you bits of software installing and bits of application running including monkeying around with floppy disk images. I mean, I suppose I could have just used an emulator, but a lot of the time, I'm also trying to give you a realistic understanding of how it performed as well, which an emulator that can run many orders of magnitude faster than the original machine doesn't really give you a realistic understanding of. I mean, if you see something of footage running on my channel, it's all done with original hardware, unless I explicitly state, hey, I did this with an emulator because, I don't know, I'm showing you formatting a hard drive and I really don't want to format the hard drive in that machine. I'll then typically flip back to using the real machine at some point as well, once I've got past, you know, the destructive phase. Right, I think I've probably trespassed on your time long enough for this video, so I'm going to end it here and get back to dealing with the video that I'm uploading and designing thumbnails, because that's always exciting. And assuming this video hasn't put you off, um, why not hit the subscribe button, because I'll do notifications when I'm doing more stuff with the Kubernetes BBS for those of you following along at home.